Frodo, Pippin, and Sam made their way back to the parlor. There was no light. Mary was not there. And the fire had burned low. It was not until they had puffed up the embers into a blaze and thrown on a couple of faggots that they discovered Strider had come with them. There he was, calmly sitting in a chair by the door. Hello, said Pippin. What are you? What do you want? I am called Strider, he answered. And though he may have forgotten it, your friend promised to have a quiet talk with me. You said I might hear something to my advantage, I believe, said Frodo. What have you to say? Several things, answered Strider. But of course I have my price. What do you mean? asked Frodo sharply. Don't be alarmed. I mean just this. I will tell you what I know and give you some good advice, but I shall want a reward. And what will that be, pray? said Frodo. He suspected now that he had fallen in with a rascal, and he thought uncomfortably that he had brought only a little money with him. All of it would hardly satisfy a rogue, and he could not spare any of it. No more than you could afford, answered Strider with a slow smile, as if he guessed Frodo's thoughts. Just this. You must take me along with you until I wish to leave you. Oh, indeed, replied Frodo, surprised but not much relieved. Even if I wanted another companion, I should not agree to any such thing until I knew a good deal more about you and your business. Excellent, exclaimed Strider, crossing his legs and sitting back comfortably. You seem to be coming to your senses again, and that is all to be good. You have been much too careless so far. Very well, I will tell you what I know and leave the reward to you. You may be glad to grant it when you have heard me. Go on then, said Frodo. What do you know? Too much. Too many dark things, said Strider grimly. But as for your business... He got up and went to the door, opened it quickly and looked out. Then he shut it quietly and sat down again. I have quick ears. He went on, lowering his voice. And though I cannot disappear, I have hunted many wild and wary things, and I can usually avoid being seen if I wish. Now, I was behind the hedge this evening on the road west of Bree when four hobbits came out to the downlands. I need not repeat all that they said to old Bombadil or to one another, but one thing interested me. Please remember, said one of them, that the name Baggins must not be mentioned. I am Mr. Underhill if any name must be given. That interested me so much that I followed them here. I slipped over the gate just behind them. Maybe Mr. Baggins had an honest reason for leaving his name behind, but if so, I should advise him and his friends to be more careful. I don't see what interest my name has for anyone in Bree, said Frodo angrily, and I have still to learn why it interests you. Mr. Strider may have an honest reason for spying and eavesdropping, but if so, I should advise him to explain it. <laughs> well answered, said Strider laughing, but the explanation is simple. I was looking for a hobbit called Frodo Baggins. I wanted to find him quickly. I had learned that he was carrying out of the Shire. Well, a secret that had concerned me and my friends. Oh, now, now, don't mistake me, he cried as Frodo rose from his seat and Sam jumped up with the scowl. I shall take more care of the secret than you do. Care is needed. He leaned forward and looked at them. Watch every shadow, he said in a low voice. Black horsemen have passed through Bree. On Monday, one came down the Greenway, they say, and another appeared later, coming up the Greenway from the south. There was silence. At last, Frodo spoke to Pippin and Sam. I ought to have guessed it from the way the gatekeeper greeted us, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. he said. And the landlord seems to have heard something. Why did he press us to join the company? And why on earth did we behave so foolishly? We ought to have stayed quiet in here. It would have been better, said Strider. I would have stopped your going into the common room if I could, but the innkeeper would not let me in to see you. I'll take a message. Do you think he- Began Frodo. No, I don't think any harm of old Butterbur. Only he does not together like mysterious vagabonds of my sort. Frodo gave him a puzzled look. Well, I have a rather rascally look, have I not? Said Strider with a curl of his lip and a queer gleam in his eye. But I hope we shall get to know one another the better. When we do, I hope you will explain what happened at the end of your song. For well, that little prank... It was sheer accident, interrupted Frodo. I wonder, said Strider. Accident, then. That accident has made your position dangerous. Hardly more than it was already, said Frodo. I knew these horsemen were pursuing me, but now at any rate they seem to have missed me and have gone away. You must not count on that, said Strider sharply. They will return, and more are coming. 
There are others. I know their number. I know these riders. He paused, and his eyes were cold and hard. And there are some folk in Bree who are not to be trusted. He went on. Bill Fernie, for instance. He has an evil name in Breeland, and queer folk call it his house. You must have noticed him among the company. A swarthy, sneering fellow. He was very close with one of the southern strangers, and he slipped out together just after your accident. Not all of those southerners mean well, and as for Fernie, he would sell anything to anybody, or make mischief for amusement. What, 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 what will Fernie sell? What has my accident got to do with him? Said Frodo, still determined not to understand Strider's hints. News of you, of course, answered Strider. An account of your performance would be very interesting to certain people. After that, they would hardly need to be told your real name. It seems to me only too likely that they will hear of it before this night is over. Is that enough? You can do as you like about my reward. Take me as a guide or not, but I may say that I know all these lands between the Shire and the Misty Mountains, where I have wandered over them for many years. I am older than I look. I might prove useful. You will have to leave the open road after tonight, for the horsemen will watch at night and day. You may escape from Bree and be allowed to go forward while the sun is up, but you won't go far. They will come on you in the wild, in some dark place where there is no help. Do you wish them to find you? They are terrible. The hobbits looked at him and saw with surprise that his face was drawn as if with pain, and his hands clenched the arms of his chair. The room was very quiet and still, and the light seemed to have grown dim. For a while he sat with his unseeing eyes, as if walking in distant memory, or listening to sounds in the night far away. There, he cried after a moment, drawing his hands across his brow. Perhaps I know more about these pursuers than you do. You fear them, but you do not fear them enough yet. Tomorrow you will have to escape if you can. Strider can take you by paths that are seldom trodden. Will you have him? There was a heavy silence. Frodo made no answer. His mind was confused with doubt and fear. Sam frowned and looked at his master, and at last he broke out. With your leave, Mr. Frodo, I say no. This strider here, he warns and he says take care, and I say yes to that. Let, let's begin with him. He comes out of the wild, and I've never heard no good of such folk. He knows something. That's plain. But it's no reason why we should let him go leading us out into some dark place far from help, as he puts it. Pippin fidgeted and looked uncomfortable. Strider did not reply to Sam, but turned his keen eyes on Frodo. Frodo caught his glance and looked away. No, he said slowly. I don't agree. I think... I think you are not really as you choose to look. You began to talk to me like the Bree folk, but your voice has changed. Still, Sam seems right in this. Still, I, I don't see why you should warn us to take care, and yet ask us to take you on trust. Why the disguise? Who are you? And what do you really know about... about my business? And how do you know it? The lesson in caution has been well learned, said Strider with a grim smile. But caution is one thing, and wavering is another. You will never get to Rivendell, or now on your own, and to trust me is your only chance. You must make up your mind. I will answer some of your questions if that will help you do so. But why should you believe my story if you do not trust me already? Still, here it is. At that moment, there came a knock at the door. Mr. Butterbur had arrived with candles, and behind him was Nob with cans of hot water. Strider withdrew into the dark corner. Oh, I've come to bid you good night, said the landlord, putting the candles on the table. Nob, take the water to the rooms. He came in and shut the door. It's, it's like this, he began, hesitating and looking troubled. If I've done any harm, I'm sorry indeed. But one thing drives out another, you'll admit, and I'm a busy man. Uh, but, but, but first one thing and then another had this week have jobbed my memory, as the saying goes. And not too late, I hope. You see, I was asked to look for out for hobbits in a shire. And for one by the name of Baggins in particular. And what has that got to do with me? Asked Frodo. Ah, uh, you know best, said the landlord knowingly. I won't give you away, but I was told that this Baggins would be going by the name of Underhill, and, uh, and I was given the description that fits you well enough, if I may say so. Indeed. L let's have it then, said Frodo, unwisely interrupting. Uh, uh, um, a stout little fellow with red cheeks, said Mr. Butterbur solemnly. 
Pippin chuckled, but Sam looked indignant. That won't help very much. It goes for most hobbits. Barley, he says to me, continued Mr. Butterbur with a glance at Pippin, but this one is taller than some, and, and fairer than most, and he has a cleft in his chin. A perky chap with a bright eye, begging your pardon, but he said it, not, not me. He said it? And who is he? asked Frodo eagerly. Ah, that was Gandalf, if you know who I mean. A wizard, they say he is. And he's a good friend of mine, whether or no. But now I don't know what he'll have to say to me. If I see him again, I'll turn all my ale sour or me into a block of wood, I shouldn't wonder. He's a bit hasty. Still, what's, what's done can't be undone. Well, what have you done? said Frodo, getting impatient with the slow unravelling of Butterbur's thoughts. Oh, where was I? said the landlord, pausing and snapping his fingers. Ah, yes, old Gandalf. Three months back, he walked right into my room without a knock. Barley, he says, I'm going off in the morning. Will you do something for me? You've only to name it, I said. I'm in a hurry, said he, and I've no time for myself, but I want a message took to the Shire. Have you anyone you can send and trust to go? Oh, I can find someone, I said. Tomorrow may be, or the day after. Make it tomorrow, he says. And then he gave me a letter. It's a, it's a dress, plain enough said Mr. Butterbur, producing a letter from his pocket and reading out the address slowly and proudly. He valued his reputation as a lettered man. <clears throat> Mr. Frodo Baggins, Baggins, Hobbiton in the Shire. A letter from me, from Gandalf, cried Frodo. Ah, said Mr. Butterbur, then your right name is Baggins? It is, said Frodo. And you had better give me that letter at once and explain why you never sent it. That's what you came to tell me, I suppose, though you've taken a long time to come to the point. Poor Mr. Butterbur looked troubled. You're right, master, he said, and I beg your pardon, I'm and I'm mortal afraid of what Gandalf will say if harm comes of it, but I didn't keep it back a purpose. I put it by safe. And then I couldn't find nobody willing to go to the Shire the next day, nor the day after, and none of my own folk were to spare. And then one thing and one and after another drove it out of my mind, and I'm a busy man. I'll do what I can to set matters right, and if there's any help I can give, you've only to name it. Leaving the letter aside, I promised Gandalf no less. Barley, he says to me, this friend of mine from the Shire, he may be coming up this way before long, him and another. He'll be calling himself Underhill. Mind that, but you need ask no questions, and if I'm not with him, he may be in trouble, and he may need help. Do whatever you can for him, and I'll be grateful, he says. And here you are, and trouble is not far off, seemingly. What do you mean? asked Frodo. <laughs> These black men said the landlord, lowering his voice. They're looking for baggins, and if they mean well, then I'm a hobbit. It was on Monday. All the dogs were yammering and the geese screaming. Uncanny, I called it. Nob, he came and told me that two black men were at the door asking for a hobbit called baggins. Nob's hair was all stood on end. I bid the black fellows be off and slammed the door on them. But they've been asking the same question all the way to Archit, I hear. And that ranger... Strider. He's been asking questions too. Tried to get in here to say you before you'd had a bite or sup, he did. He did, said Strider suddenly, coming forward into the light. And much trouble would have been saved if you had let him in, Barleyman. The landlord jumped with surprise. You! He cried. You're always popping up. What do you want now? He's here with my leave, said Frodo. He came to offer me his help. <gasps> oh. 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 Well, well, you you know your business, maybe, said Mr. Butterbur, looking suspiciously at Strider. But if I was in your plight, I wouldn't take up with a ranger. Then who would you take up with? asked Strider. A fat innkeeper who only remembers his own name because people shouted at him all day. They cannot stay in the pony forever. They cannot go home. They have a long road before them. Will you go with them and keep the black men off? Me? Brave Bree? I wouldn't do that for any money, said Mr. Butterbur, looking really scared. Why can't you stay here for quiet for a bit, Mr. Underhill? What are all these queer goings on? What are all these black men after? And where do they come from, I'd like to know? I'm sorry, I can't explain it all, answered Frodo. I'm tired and very worried, and it's a long tale. But if you mean to help me, I ought to warn you that you will be in danger as long as I am in your house. These black riders, I'm not sure, but I think, I fear they come from... They come from Mordor, said Strider with a low voice. From Mordor, Balaman, if that means anything to you. <gasps> oh, save us! cried Mr. Butterbur, turning pale. The name evidently was known to him. 
That is the worst news that has come to me in my time. It is, said Frodo. Are you still willing to help me? Oh, yeah, said Mr. Butterbur. More than ever. Though I don't know what the likes of me can do against... Against... He faltered. Against the shadow of the East, said Strider quietly. Not much, Barleyman, but every little helps. You can let Mr. Underhill stay here tonight, as Mr. Underhill and you can forget the name of Baggins till he is far away. Right. <laughs> I'll do that said Mr. Butterbur. But they'll find out he's here without help from me, I'm afraid. It's a pity Mr. Baggins drew attention to himself this evening, to say no more. The story of that Mr. Bilbo's going off has been heard before tonight in Bree. Even our knob has been doing some guessing this slow pate. And there are others in Bree quicker in uptake than he is. Well, we can only hope that the writers won't come back yet, said Frodo. I hope not indeed, said Butterbur. But spooks on look spooks, they won't get in the pony so easy. Don't you worry until the morning. No will say no word. No black man shall pass my doors while I can stand on my legs. Me and my folk will keep watch tonight. But you had best get some sleep if you can. In any case, we must be cold at dawn, said Frodo. We must get off as early as possible. Breakfast at 6.30, please. Right. I'll see to the orders, said the landlord. Good night, Mr. Bag Baggins. Underhill, I should say. Rest me! Where's your Mr. Brandybuck? I don't know, said Frodo with sudden anxiety. They had forgotten all about Mary, and it was getting late. I'm afraid he is out. He said something about going for a breath of air. Well, you do want looking after, and no mistake, your party might be on a holiday, said Mr. Butterbur. I must go and bar the doors quick, but I'll see your friend is laid in when he comes. I'd better send Nob to look for him. Good night to you all. At last, Mr. Butterbur went out. With another doubtful look at Strider and a shake of his head, his footsteps retreated down the passage. Well, said Strider, when are you going to open that letter? Frodo looked carefully at the seal before he broke in. It seemed certainly to be Gandalf's. Inside, written in the wizard's strong but graceful script, was the following message. The Prancing Pony. Bree. Midia's Day, Shire, Year 1418. Dear Frodo, bad news has reached me here. I must go off at once. You had better leave back in soon, and get out of the Shire before the end of July and latest. I will return as soon as I can, and I will follow you if I find that you are gone. Leave a message for me here. If you pass through Bree, you can trust the landlord, Butterbur. You may meet a friend of mine on the road, a man, lean, dark, tall, by some called Strider. He knows your business and will help you. Make for Rivendell. There I hope we may meet again. If I do not come, Elrond will advise you. Yours in haste, Gandalf. Postscript. Do not use it again. Not for any reason whatever. Do not travel by night. Post postscript. Make sure that it is a real strider. There are many strange men on the roads. His true name is Aragorn. All that is gold does not glitter. Not all those who wander are lost. The old that is strong does not wither. Deep roots are not reached by the frost. And the ashes of fire shall be woken. A light from the shadows shall spring. Renewed shall be blade that was broken. The crownless again shall be king. I hope Butterbur sends this promptly. A worthy man, but his memory is like a lumber room. Thing wanted always buried. If he forgets, I shall roast him. Farewell. Frodo read the letter to himself, and then passed it to Pippin and Sam. Thank you. Really? Old Butterbur has made a mess of things, he said. He deserves roasting. If I had got this at once, we might all have been safe in Rivendell by now. <sighs> but what can have happened to Gandalf? He writes as if he was going into great danger. He has been doing that for many years, said Strider. Frodo turned and looked at him thoughtfully, wondering about Gandalf's second postscript. Why didn't you tell me that you were Gandalf's friend at once? He answered. It would have saved time. Would it? Would any of you have believed me till now? Said Strider. I knew nothing of this letter. 
For all I knew, I had to persuade you to trust me without proofs, if I was to help you. In any case, I did not intend to tell you all about myself at once. I had to study you first, and make sure of you. The enemy has set traps for me before now. As soon as I had made up my mind, I was ready to tell you whatever you asked. <laughs> but I must admit, he added with a queer laugh, that I hoped he would take to me for my own sake. A hunted man sometimes wearies of distrust and longs for friendship. But there, I believe my looks are against me. <laughs> they are, at first sight at any rate. Laughed Pippin with sudden relief after reading Gandalf's letter. But handsome is as handsome does, as we say in the Shire, and I dare say we shall all look much the same after lying for days in hedges and ditches. It would take more than a few days, or weeks, or years of wandering in the wild to make you look like Strider, he answered, and you would die first, unless you are made of sterner stuff than you look to be. Pippin subsided, but Sam was not daunted. He still eyed Strider dubiously. Hmm. How do we know that you are the Strider that Gandalf speaks about? He demanded. You never mentioned Gandalf till this letter came out. He might be a play-acting spy. For all I can see, trying to get us to go with you, you might have done him the real Strider and took his clothes. What have you to say to that? That you are a stout fellow, answered Strider. But I'm afraid my only answer to you, Sam Gamgee, is this. If I had killed the real Strider, I could kill you. And I should have killed you already without so much talk. If I was after the ring, I could have it. Now. He stood up and seemed suddenly to grow taller. In his eyes gleamed the light, keen and commanding. Throwing back his cloak, he laid his hand on the hilt of a sword that had hung concealed by his side. They did not dare to move. Sam sat wide-mouthed, staring at him dumbly. But I am the real Strider, fortunately. He said, looking down at them with his face softened by a sudden smile. I am Aragorn. Son of Erethorn, and if by my life or death I can save you, I will. There was a long silence. At last, Frodo spoke with hesitation. I believe that you're a friend before the letter came, he said. Or at least, I wish to. You have frightened me several times tonight, but never in the way that the servants of the enemy would, or so I imagine. I think one of his spies would, well, seem fairer feel fouler, if you understand. <laughs> I see, laughed Strider. I look foul and feel fair, is that it? All that is gold does not glitter, not all those who wander are lost. Uh, did these verses apply to you, then? asked Frodo. I could not make out what they were about. But how did you know that they were in Gandalf's letter if you've never seen it? I did not know, he answered. But I am Aragorn. And those verses go with that name. He drew out his sword, and they saw the blade was indeed broken a foot below the hilt. Not much use is it, Sam, said Strider. But the time is near when it shall be forged anew. Sam said nothing. Well, said Strider, with Sam's permission, we will call that settled. Strider shall be your guide. He shall have a rough road tomorrow. Even if we are allowed to leave Bree unhindered, we can hardly hope now to leave it unnoticed. But I shall try to get lost as soon as possible. I know one or two ways out of Bree land other than the main road. If once we shake off the pursuit, I shall make for Weathertop. Weathertop, said Sam. What's that? It is a hill just to the north of the road, about halfway from here to Rivendell. It commands a wide view all around, and there we shall have a chance to look about us. Gandalf will make for that point if he follows us. After Weathertop, our journey will become more difficult, and we shall have to choose between various dangers. When did you last see Gandalf? Asked Frodo. Do you know where he is, or what he is doing? Strider looked grave. I do not know, he said. I came west with him in the spring. I have often kept watch on the borders of the Shire in the last few years when he was busy elsewhere. He seldom left it unguarded. We last met on the 1st of May, at Saren Ford, down on the Brandywine. He told me that his business with you had gone well, and that you would be starting for Rivendell in the last week of September. 
As I knew he was at your side, I went away on a journey of my own, and that was proven ill. But plainly, some news reached him. I was not at hand to help. I am troubled. For the first time since I have known him, we should have had messages, even if he could not come himself. When I returned many days ago, I heard the ill news. The tidings had gone far and wide that Gandalf was missing and the horsemen had been seen. It was the elven folk of Gildor that told me this. And later they told me that you had left your home, but there was no news of your leaving Buckland. I have been watching the East Road anxiously. Do you think that the Black Riders have anything to do with it? With Gandalf's absence, I mean? Asked Frodo. I do not know of anything else that would have hindered them except the enemy himself, said Strider. But do not give up hope. Gandalf is greater than you, Shire Folk, no. As a rule, you can only see his jokes and toys. But this business of ours will be his greatest task. Pippin yawned. Oh, I am sorry, he said. But I am dead tired. In spite of all the danger and worry, I must go to bed or sleep where I sit. Where is that silly fellow, Mary? That would be the last straw if we had to go out into the dark to look for him. At that moment, they heard a door slam. Then feet came running along the passage. Mary came in with a rush, followed by Nob. He shut the door hastily and leaned against it. He was out of breath. They stared at him in alarm for a moment before he gasped. I've seen him, Frodo. I've seen him. Black riders. Black riders. Where? Here, in the village. I stayed indoors for an hour. And as you did not come back, I went out for a stroll. I had come back again and was standing just outside the light of the lamp looking at the stars. Suddenly I shivered and felt that something horrible was creeping near. There was a sort of deeper shade among the shadows across the road, just beyond the edge of the lamplight. It slid away at once in the dark without a sound. There was no horse. Which way did he go? Answered Strider suddenly and sharply. When he started, noticing the stranger for the first time. Go on, said Frodo. He is a friend of Gandalf's. I'll explain later. He seemed to make off up the road eastward, continued Mary. I tried to follow. Of course it vanished almost at once, but I went round the corner and on as far as the last house on the road. Strider looked at Mary with wonder. You have a stout heart, he said, but it was foolish. But I, I don't know, said Mary. Neither brave nor silly, I think. I could hardly help myself. I seemed to be drawn somehow. Anyway, I went, and suddenly I heard voices by the hedge. One was muttering, and the other was whispering or hissing. I couldn't hear a word that was said. I, I did not creep any closer, because I began to tremble all over. Then I felt terrified. I turned back, and I was just going to bolt home when something came behind me, and I... I fell over. I found him, sir. Put in Nob. Mr. Butterbur set me out in the lantern. I went out to the, to the west gate and then uh, then back up towards the south gate, just nigh Bill Fernie's house, and I thought I could see something on the road. I couldn't swear to it, but it looked to me as if two men were stooping over something, lifting it. I gave a shout, but when I got up to the spot there were, there were no signs of them, and only Mr. Brandybuck lying there on the roadside. He seemed to be asleep. I thought I had fallen into deep water, he says to me, when I shook him. Uh, very queer he was, and as soon as I had roused him, he got up and ran back here like a hare. <laughs> I'm afraid that's true, said Mary, though I don't know what I said. I had an ugly dream, which I can't remember. I went to pieces, and I don't know what came over me. I do, said Strider, the black breath. The riders must have left their horses outside, and passed back through the south gate in secret. They will know all the news now, for they have visited Bill Fernie, and probably that Southerner was a spy as well. Something may happen in the night before we leave Bree. What will happen? said Mary. Will they attack the inn? No, I think not, said Strider. They are not all here yet. And in any case, that is not their way. In dark and loneliness, they are strongest. They will not openly attack a house with their lights and many people. Not until they are desperate. Not a while all the long leagues of very door still lie before us. But their power is in terror. And already some in Bree are in that clutch. They will drive these wretches to some evil work. Bernie, and some of the strangers, and maybe the gatekeeper too. They had words with Harry at the West Gate on Monday. I was watching them. He was white and shaking when they left him. Oh, 
We seem to have enemies all around, said Frodo. What are we to do? Stay here. Do not go into your rooms. They are sure to have found out which those are. The Hobbit rooms have windows looking north and closer to the ground. We will all remain together and bar this window and the door. But first, Nob and I will fetch your luggage. While Strider was gone, Frodo gave Mary a rapid account of all that had happened since supper. Mary was still reading and pondering Gandalf's letter when Strider and Nob returned. Uh, well, masters, said Nob, I've rumpled up the clothes and put in a bolster down the middle of each bed. And I made a nice imitation of your head with a brown folded mat. Mr. Bag, uh, under here, sir. He added with a grin. Pippin laughed. Ha! Huh. Very lifelike, he said. But what will happen when they penetrate the disguise? We shall see, said Strider. Let us hope to hold the fort to morning. Uh, good night to you, said Nob, and went off to take his part in the watch on the doors. Their bags and gear they piled on the parlor floor. They pushed a low chair against the door and shut the window. Peering out, Frodo saw that the night was still clear. The sickle, the hobbit's name for the plow or great bear, was swinging bright above the shoulders of Bree Hill. He then closed and barred the heavy inside shutters and drew the curtains together. Strider built up the fire and blew out all the candles. The hobbits lay down on their blankets with their feet towards the hearth. But Strider settled himself in the chair against the door. They talked for a while, but Mary still had several questions to ask. <laughs> Jumped over at the moon, chuckled Mary as he rolled himself in his blanket. Very ridiculous of you, Frodo. Uh, but I wish I'd been here to see. The worthies of Bree will be discussing it a hundred years since. I hope so, said Strider. Then they all fell silent, and one by one, the hobbits dropped off to sleep.